So welcome to today's podcast. You're in for a little bit of a treat um, where we have got for us an amazing guest, Dr. Jay Wiles from Hanu Health, who is an expert in HRV, which stands for heart rate variability. He is one of the, like, the leading guy literally in the world for this. was almost amazed that we managed to get him to come onto the podcast um, is going to dive into everything about like why heart rate variability. The, those of you that have got like an O ring or a Whoop band or like a, some of the Garmin watches, there will be uh, it says technology that you've got that is got uh, data for you about your recovery, about your how your nervous system is performing. He's going to explain in great detail as to like what that is all about and then how you can use it and get the most out of it and ultimately one of the things i love about jay is that he's uh, not only the, the depth of understanding that he's got in this area but is also the fact that he um he is encouraging us to not become reliant on these things but actually only just use these things to be able to understand yourself better so that ultimately like you you um we want to get to a place where we understand our bodies this is a tool to help us but ultimately you're listening getting better at listening to your body and being able to listen to what your body is telling you in terms of like what your levels of stress are like what the what your recovery is like from training what your sleep's been like and not having to rely on these things but just using these things as tools to help us understand ourselves better so we can live healthier happier lives um, one thing is to say timbo he's on holiday so actually it's just jacko doing the interview now um, as exciting and also scary at the same time that is um, obviously I'm talking to a doctor so I try to do my best job at um, not being too uh, too stupid cracked the odd joke made him laugh a couple of times but kept uh, it was it was obviously a serious conversation so I kept uh, I kept trying to be serious and uh, hopefully um, you know if you if if like me you're missing Timbo with him being away on holiday do not fear uh, he is back next week uh, with me on the podcast and uh, we can look forward to that but in the meantime we get to look forward to Jay Wells on the the movement. I can't remember what I'm doing on the movement, strength, and play podcast by the School of Calisthenics. Crikey, I nearly butchered that, didn't I? Um, so sit back, relax, uh, and enjoy this week's podcast. Listen, players. <laughs> You're listening to the Movement, Strength and Play podcast by the School of Calisthenics. Here are your hosts, Tim and Jacko. So Jay, welcome to the Movement, Strength and Play podcast. Excited to have you on and speak to you about heart rate variability and your expertise in that. Yeah, man. So good to be here. We're, we're going to dive into some fun topics, I'm sure. Yes, we've got obviously the, the listeners are uh, uh, avid you know, uh, fitness enthusiasts, and you know we've introduced them. Well, we've been, we've been lucky to get introduced to so many great guests over the uh, over two hundred episodes now. And um, you know, one area that we haven't gone too far into really is trying to understand what sort of like um, uh, technology and things that we have available to us now that can help us understand our bodies better, so that we can recover better, so we can be more resilient, so we can make our training more optimized for us and um you know you you're you're an expert in that field and so um it'd be really nice just for there's probably one listener so one one stupid listener that hasn't heard of uh, uh dr jay whilst before <laughs> and so who uh just just for that one person a little bit of background to you how did you get you know how did sure. you get into this heart rate variability stuff and and a little bit of a 101 on what actually is hrv uh at yeah. sort of a base level and then we can sort of take it take a bit of a deeper dive from there yeah, in, in, indeed. So, you know, my background is as a clinical health psychologist. So I'm, my, my doctoral degree is in clinical psychology, and then I specialized in the field of health psychology, which is really looking at the intersection between mental health and physical well-being, because right. we know there's a bi-directional relationship right there, right? You know, kind of what's happening with our psychological processes, cognitive processes is going to affect our physiology, our body, and then vice versa. What's going on in the body can send a direct signal and affect kind of our psychological and cognitive processes. 
So I, I was really interested in, initially in studying kind of uh, human health and optimization performance, um, especially for individuals who are battling with type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and chronic pain, um, and utilizing more like integrative strategies for helping with kind of those, those related issues. And so I, uh, when I was doing my residency, which was in Richmond, Virginia, for the Department of Veteran Affairs, I was working with in, in the medical center. I was actually expo uh, exposed on one of my rounds, uh, or was actually, you know, one of my rotations was in an integrative pain center. And in the integrative pain center was really utilized for veterans who were kind of sick and tired on being on opioid based medications, right. you know, kind of, you know, there's a huge, obviously an opioid pep uh, epidemic, but the problem is within the VA system, it's even worse. So veterans yeah. um, are, are, are pretty bad when it comes to the, the opioid crisis. One of the things that we saw uh, is just that these, these veterans were sick and tired of it they were like lived with this now for you know decades among decades and wanted to find new and unique and effective and scientifically backed approaches for chronic pain and within this clinic it was awesome because they they tried to titrate these individuals off of opioid medications through the use of integrated therapies like things like tai chi and yoga and qigong um, acupuncture right. mindfulness meditation you know manipulative therapies uh, all of these things but the other one that was utilized which i haven't mentioned was something called biofeedback and more in particular it was heart rate variability biofeedback and that was actually my first exposure to heart rate variability and the utilization of biometrics in order to measure the human stress response and then also to the interconnection that HRV has with chronic pain. But the unique thing was is that I saw the, these veterans who are engaging in heart rate variability training which is really kind of, to me, just looked like a high-tech way of kind of enhancing breathing or breath work, right. I saw them getting better. They were reducing yeah. kind of their subjective pain experience. They were coping better with it. They were becoming more resilient to their pain. And then, yes, they were coming off of opioid-based medications. Yeah. And we actually published a study on this uh, when I was there as a resident uh, and presented this at n uh, numerous medical conferences where we saw that these individuals uh, were seeing significant reductions in stress when right. heart rate variability was being increased. So they would stress less and then heart, heart rate variability would be kind of like that objective measure that they would see that would coincide. Yeah. And again, that kind of just kickstarted me. I was like, okay, this is fascinating. <laughs> like I, 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 I never would have thought because, you know, I was conventionally trained as a psychologist. I yeah. would have never thought that kind of this type of integrative approach would be, uh, you know, something that could effectively work for reducing pain. And that was just a thing that kind of curtailed me into kind of going into research in the field of heart rate variability in the field of psychophysiology and the field of human stress response. And, you know, I kind of just to develop more or less a niche in that I've learned a lot about a little, um, yeah. and, uh, well, that's and life that's changing kind of for those, that's life changing for those people, right? Like that must yeah. be yeah. incredible to be part of that experience for like, how, yeah. how's it, how's that sort of, how's that make you feel? When... Well, you know, yeah, it's one of those things that it's like for me, it, it, like there's especially with the veteran population. These are a lot of, you know, obviously um, predominantly males, rough and tough individuals who like are coming to this integrative pain center. And like a little bit of them were kind of like, listen, I have like exercised all my resources. And now like I'm going to try this, you know, yoga and Tai Chi crap. I'm going to try this, you know, biofeedback crap. And they like they talk like that. too. They're like, <laughs> I don't believe in this woo woo stuff. But uh, I might as well they, have do it <laughs> right right and then they they engage in it and then they're like oh my goodness like i cannot believe this like this is incredible um and then they get sold on it and then when we see kind of how that impacts their overall life so yes they reduce their pain experience but they increase you know their ability to engage in relationships to exercise to kind of do all these things that they yeah. really have been missing out on because chronic pain has held them back Man, it, it is just awesome to see it, and it's kind of why I've, you know, kind of, you know, preaching the gospel now of heart rate variability training, heart yeah. rate variability, biofeedback, and breath work, because I have just seen it, um, you know, not just make like these marginal small changes, yeah. but really been life changing for these individuals. Yeah. So, yeah, man, yeah. it's incredible. Mate, you're doing great. You're doing, yeah, amazing, amazing work, and like, you know, there'll be some really good stuff that's going to come in, in in the conversation as we go on further for li the listeners Indeed. to be able to go, okay. I can take some of this to help improve my uh, my training, and and you know that's obviously important for those of us that are really um, really passionate about training and exercise and how that makes us right. feel and how that improves our lives. But you know the the what you're doing like wider than that is obviously um, you know is, is obviously amazing work and, and, yeah. and valuable within like yeah within within people's lives. So like credit to you for that. There's yeah, so there's you. like a couple of um, 
terms there that like we're talking about like HRV or heart rate variability and, and mm-hmm. biofeedback. And so for, you know, for lay in, in layman's terms, you know, I came across probably mm-hmm. this and you um, initially from um, s- some work you've done with Patrick McKeown at the Oxygen Advantage. Mm-hmm. And right, it right. was like, okay, this is, uh, I've never been like, I've, I've, I have got a Garmin now to mainly for my, um, to, to track my, I want to know my pace when I'm running for doing stupid marathons and things like that. Um, but I've never been like mad into into um, into tech, but sort of coming across what you've uh, what you've what you've been doing has has made me get obviously more uh, interested. I've converted in that. you. Look at it. Conver- look yeah, at yeah, it. Look, yeah. <laughs> and so um, for for me, like you know, me as a layman, um, I, I put myself in that category as well. But where you're going, HRV it stands for heart rate variability. So mm-hmm. it's something to do with our our, our heart yeah. rate and variability, like how it's changing, like. So, because some people will have whoop bands or an aura ring mm-hmm. or they've got an apple watch and they've got some markers or things but it's like what actually is it and do i want my heart rate to be like the same all the time or like how how mm-hmm. is that what yeah. what to be and then when you say biofeedback markers like what what, mm-hmm. what are we actually talking about yeah yeah it's it, it's always great to clarify kind of off the bat what heart rate variability yeah. is and then how it relates um to kind of our discussion because uh you know it, it is so accessible to everybody now right i mean if you get an aura ring or an apple watch or fitbit or you know a whoop strap or you know whatever tech that's out there right now almost every single one of them at least has one parameter of heart rate variability so a lot of people who have let's say like aura ring if they got it for their sleep you know they'll wake up each morning and they'll see that you know the, their readiness score a huge uh, characteristic of that readiness score that's built into the algorithm is the heart rate variability component and it's the same thing with whoop so a lot of people are becoming familiar with seeing that term but they're still like i I have no idea what it is or if they may have a basic understanding or maybe their understanding is a little bit tainted because there's a lot of unfortunate misinformation out there on heart rate variability which you know there's misinformation just about on everything but (laughs) heart rate variability is one of them but i'll put it in kind of its most um technical terms and explain it that way and then i'll explain it in i I think a very easy to understand layman's kind of uh, 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 terminology or even analogy. Yeah. So when we think about heart rate variability, it as it is as, as simple as it sounds, it's the variability within your heart rate so that is the pure kind of like nitty-gritty scientific like easy explanation that probably doesn't make a lot of sense to people so like (laughs) do you want variance in your heart rate do you not let me explain so most people know what heart rate is i mean everybody probably nowadays has some accessibility to detect your heart rate you can do it one or two ways you can have technology which is you know really fast and simple easy way to do it you also can take your two fingers place them on the carotid artery of your neck and and for 10 seconds it's a classic way (laughs) Everybody has access to heart rate. I mean, you can put it on the carotid artery, count for how many beats happen in a matter of 10 seconds. You start a stopwatch, you times that by six because there's 60 seconds mm-hmm. and within a minute and you've got your average heart rate. And if you so haven't got one, with that. if you haven't got one, you're dead. <laughs> then, then you're either, yeah, you're either a vampire uh, and I want to meet you. Come on my yeah. podcast too. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. So, so, you know, that everybody kind of knows how to do that and everybody kind of conceptually understands what heart rate is, right? So I'll just use easy math. Well, if your heart rate is at 60 right now, if your average heart rate is at 60, then that means that for every second, because there's again, 60 seconds in a minute, every one second, that means you're on average, your heart is beating. Now to the everyday individual intuitively, you would think that, okay, so the last minute, that means that my heart rate beat. Uh, or had uh, had a kind of a time frame in between of one second each time that yeah. it beat. And what that would actually equate to in terms of heart rate variability is a heart rate variability of zero. That means that the heart paced itself the entire 60 uh, seconds yeah. at, at one second, you know, per or one beat per second. That would not be the way it works. Um, yeah. That would actually be indicative of someone who's in really serious trouble, and you wouldn't necessarily see that with someone uh, uh, with a low of heart rate of 60. Yeah. So what we have to think about heart rate in terms and heart rate variability in terms of what comes before and what comes after each heartbeat. So what comes before each heartbeat is a heartbeat, and what comes after each heartbeat is another heartbeat. The space in between is time. And the time varies across the respiratory cycle. So when we breathe in and we breathe out, the heart rate actually goes up and then it comes down. And I'll explain kind of the physiology behind that. But that means that the heart is going to vary and it's going to go up to, let's say, you know, up to um, uh, 70 from 50. It starts at 50, goes up to 70. And then when you breathe out, it goes down to 50. 
that change, that, du that duration of change and that frequency of change is what we refer to as variance in heartbeat or the variance in between the inner beat intervals of the heart and is makes up the score of heart rate variability. Yeah. Now, and then that's kind of the explanation as to what heart rate variability is. But, you know, w you know what does it actually mean? How do we interpret it? Yeah. It's a whole nother story. The best way to think about heart rate variability is that it is the single greatest non-invasive proxy that we have for the human stress response and for the nervous system. We know that in order for the nervous system to be resilient, which is very much interconnected with our cardiorespiratory health, that we want to see a heart and lungs that are extremely adaptive because yeah. we have trillions of processes that are occurring in the body at any given moment, which means that the heart, the lungs, and every other part of our body has to respond accordingly to all trillions of processes that are occurring in the body at any moment yeah. so basically when a heart starts to regulate itself like a metronome that's a warning sign when heart rate yeah. variability goes down that's a warning sign it's saying something is taxing me so much that I have to create some sense of, uh, of a lack of chaos and pace myself yeah. so it's a great way of thinking it about it is that the heart is never to act like a metronome yeah. unless it is truly trying to save yeah. you for something or provide itself as a warning sign one thing that's really interesting, Jacko, is that we see uh, from research um, in the cardiovascular realm um, is that when someone is about to have a myocardial infarction, which is you know, a scientific term for a heart attack, yeah. is that their heart will pace itself like a metronome and HRV will drop almost to zero. It will wow. drop that close. Yeah. And that is like the telltale sign. So if I, for instance, if I were to put somebody onto a device um, and, and we were looking at them from a clinical grade, let's say each ECG, and I was looking at their heart rate and I saw that that type of pacing in their heart, an increased heart rate, and then also to a pacing that was almost limited to, you know, zero, I would be very concerned and I would have them do a full workup and make sure that they're not about to have a heart attack. I mean, that's never happened to me, but I am, am trained enough to know kind of yeah. when to make that referral. So I don't want to derail us too much, yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what heart rate variability is. Is um, because in, I guess, like you said, like almost when you, before you've before you've thought about it or actually been taught about it or understood it, if someone was like you say that 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 analogy of or that example of sixty beats per minute, you just think, well, it's just being every, and you and you you'd almost um, think that um, the more regular it is, that that would mm. be healthier. Is is absolutely is that what? Is that what like doctors and stuff thought before we could actually measure it? Was it was this quite a bit of a, like a whoa? We didn't realize that, or is it something that people theorized and under, thought they knew it, but we just didn't, didn't have a way of measuring it before? Yeah, you know, like with every great scientific discovery, it has to start with a hypothesis. Um, so, yeah. you know, back well, the the earliest writing scientifically that we have is that we we knew um, that there was a process that occurred across the respiratory cycle that changed heart rate pretty significantly. Right. Uh, we didn't have it termed as heart rate variability yet because we didn't have ECGs that were able to measure kind of the changes, the yeah. finite changes. Because we're talking about milliseconds here. Yeah. You know, we're not talking about like seconds, minutes of change. We're talking about milliseconds of change that make a huge difference yeah. uh, and we can you know dive a little more into the weeds um, but you know what we actually knew and and when one of the primary influencers of heart rate variability or what makes up that metric um, yeah. what mediates that metric is a process in the body called a respiratory sinus arrhythmia or RSA yeah. and that is goes back to kind of like the speeding and slowing down of the heart rate across the respiratory cycle so the yeah. inhale the heart is always going to speed up or it should and yeah. then as you exhale it's going to slow down and as you kind of widen um, and slow down uh, the respiration rate, especially your exhalations, we actually see that from baseline, your heart rate will start to go lower. And that will, again, increase and influence heart rate variability. So I, I think that they knew about, you know, the idea of respiratory sinus arrhythmia kind of from the get go. Uh, but they didn't term this, uh, uh, they didn't term heart rate variability as kind of a biometric until later on when the ECG was invented. And then we started to see how long these that? finite changes. How, well, how oh, man, long are we talking? I, I, I used to remember, but I, I don't even remember when the ECG was created. But it's been it's been a while now. Um, yeah. It's 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 it, it's been within the century, um, not longer. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I don't have that okay. data. Cool. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. So um, and then when you talk about um, uh, biometrics, what what mm -hmm. do you mean by that term? 
Yeah, so biometrics is any type of metric that's assessing biology. Um, so that's gathering any type of data, whether it's you know on the surface of the skin, um, so externally um, yeah. looking at something that's going on internally, or ca- or capturing something internally. Um, so you know the the most common method, like when I refer to biometrics, especially within when I'm talking about heart rate variability, I'm talking about like wearable technology for the most yeah. part, because most people aren't walking around with an ECG on or you know with you know some type of medical grade equipment unless they're in a research project funny enough i have you can't see it yeah i have an ecg on right now but that's because i'm a part of of doing some research <laughs> i've also got some ppg sensors on as well i have three ppg sensors on Look my hand in. yeah and then uh and then an ecg strapped to my chest right now um, but that's because again like i'm running a company we're doing a lot of research and that's just like a part of my part you're of like my a robot you like you like uh, you're like <laughs> robocop <laughs> Indeed. I normally don't have all this stuff on. Like I try to keep like I'm a really I'm a tech guy that doesn't utilize a lot of tech. So I respect yeah. a lot of technology, but like I don't like to engage too much with tech because it can just be way too time consuming and then, you know, you can get a little bit orthorexic when you look at too much data. Like yeah. basically like it can scare you off so much that you engage in way too much um yeah. and yeah, devote yeah, way yeah. too much time and effort. So yeah, it's sorry sorry to uh you know derail us on that. But yeah, biometrics is really just kind of capturing data, um, and most people are going to um, uh, uh, feel, or I guess would experience biometrics either through wearables or yeah. like another way of getting a biometric is like when you go to your doctor's office, they throw the cuff onto your arm and they yeah. check your blood pressure. That's a biometric as yeah. as well. Yeah, cool. Okay, so then in terms of um, in terms of heart rate variability, some people will have devices we'll talk about them about about them a bit later some people have devices some people won't have devices we want to try and give some advice for 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 all of us but um just taking that like we've got that a better understanding now of what heart rate variability is um Mm -hmm. how is that actually going to how how do you use it with yourself Mm -hmm. with your clients with people how do you use it to help us actually improve um our understanding of like our training and or e- even just like wider in terms yeah. of our health. So I think I came across yeah. something where there was, it was suggesting maybe like in the early uses of heart rate variability, it was monitoring babies to give a bit of an idea mm-hmm. of their overall, overall mm-hmm. health. Did it, did it start yeah. in a process of just looking at health and we've the sporting yeah. world has like taken it to use it for other things. Oh, yeah. Is that, is that the sort yeah. of case? Yeah, no, absolutely. So where it came from initially, um, and, and, and really kind of the, the bulk amount of the research, even today, when you look at, if you go to PubMed and you search HRV studies, yeah. um, more recently, I would say it's becoming more on the mental health slash, you know, performance, um, and, and sports optimization. Like that's, that's kind of where a lot of the research has gone, but the original research in heart rate variability goes back to, um, cardio respiratory fitness and especially cardiovascular fitness and, and is used, uh, still as the gold standard, um, for looking at overall heart health, especially after right. someone has had a heart attack. It's actually the greatest predicting biometric that we have for future heart attacks. Yeah. Now, now I don't want people to get confused with that because then they'll try to start making interpretations interpretations based off their aura ring. Um, the, the, the metric that is used or the gold standard for cardiovascular respiratory fitness, um, and, and detecting future or potential myocardial infarction or heart attack is a metric called SDNN, which is a, is a great longer term 24 hour measurement. That's really captured by ECG or EKG. So, um, that's, that's again, like the category one would be like, you know, cardiovascular health. Category two um, would be where the most research kind of has been performed would be in the stress resiliency, anxiety, depression, more or less the mental health field. And I can talk about kind of its use there. And then the third one that I can talk about its use would be in the sports performance and health optimization category, which I'd say probably has the most limited research, but plenty of research there. So let me talk about like why people would actually utilize this metric kind of how, cause I'm all about like brass tacks, like, like the science is great. Like talking about the psychophysiology is great, but how could we practically use this is, is, is the most important thing. So again, let's go back to that operational yeah. definition that we have of heart rate variability is that this is a, the single greatest non-invasive proxy that we have for the human nervous system and for the human stress response. So what does that actually mean in practicality? Well, the first thing to really remember is that you need to have kind of a captured baseline in order to know where you start. And so when, if someone were to peruse kind of the literature, someone went to, were to peruse like the different biometrics of heart rate variability, like there are a ton 
ton of them. Like there are a lot of metrics that are heart rate variability. So heart rate variability is not just a singular score. It can be an aggregate of scores, but it also right. too can be just different metrics. So people may have heard of like the one I mentioned just a second ago, SDNN, may have heard of RMSSD, PNN50, low frequency, high frequency bands, very low frequency bands. Like there's all these different metrics um, that mean different things and give us different interpretations of what's going on within our nervous system. Now, I think one good clarification before I get in into the practical use of heart rate variability is just to give a really, really quick primer yeah. on what I mean by nervous system and what I mean by a proxy of the nervous system. Right. So if anybody is not familiar, um, we have um, kind of two predominant branches of our nervous system. So we have the central nervous system, which is our, uh, which is our brain and spinal cord. And then from kind of all the nerve endings, they innervate out to what's called our peripheral nervous system. And one of the branches of our peripheral nervous system, which is where we kind of hang out in, in the HRV realm is the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic is, 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 synonymous with automatic it are they are these physiological processes that occur without us having to think about it so when you think about that you think about kind of like what's going on in your intestines and your gut what's going on with your heart what's going on with your lungs you don't have to think about your heart beating you don't have to think about breathing you're going to naturally do that however what we do know is that we can influence kind of our mm -hmm. nervous system by taking control of our heart by taking control over our lungs by taking control over kind of the influence of all the nerve endings that innervate our gut. And, you know, again, we can parse those out here in just a minute, but yeah. I, I like to just kind of like talk about the two branches that make up this autonomic nervous system. That's our parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. When we think about sympathetic nervous system, that's our fight or flight response. That's kind of like the gas pedal. That's kind of when we're ready to utilize energy to either fight or flee whatever's in front of us, or just to perform actually for yeah. athletes, we want to engage that side of our nervous system. It's not to be demonized. It is uh, the thing that is going to save your life if the mountain lion jumps out at you you know on a hike like you need that sympathetic nervous system because otherwise you should be like yeah oh, no, i'm good to go or like you know you're walking across you know the highway and you're like i don't care if cars are flying you know 90 <laughs> miles an hour like i'm okay like you need something that's going to inhibit you but then also too something that is going to help you to utilize energy when needed and then that yeah and then kind of on the the opposite side of the spectrum even though i would say it is absolutely a spectrum would be your parasympathetic nervous system. You yeah. can think of parachute. It helps to bring you down. It's all about conservation of energy. It's your relaxation response. It's been referred to as the rest and digest response. And these two, they're not working competingly with one another. It's not like a seesaw um, where they actually can be engaged at the same time. I like to think of this as two footed yeah. driving. There's a guy, his name's Dr. Ron Garbo, who nice. created kind of this concept of two footed driving, very similar to like formula one yeah. racing. So in Formula One racing, like if you've got the gas pedal down and you're hitting a curve, you don't relinquish the gas pedal and then press the brake. You keep the gas pedal down, you may relinquish it a little bit and then pull the brake and then you drift through the curve. So or, or around the around the corner, a corner turn. So our nervous system works very similar oh, to that, yeah, as yeah, in yeah. we can engage the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system at the same time, kind of separately or modulate them to back and forth. Now, the intent, especially if somebody is experiencing a significant amount of stress, if they're experiencing um, uh, kind of chronic anxiety, is that that sympathetic nervous system is probably likely turned on too often. Mm -hmm. And then the parasympathetic nervous system, what we call the vagal break, um, which is referring to our 10th cranial nerve or vagus nerve, um, is probably not being activated nearly as efficiently as it should. Yeah. Now, again, when you think about someone who is encountering a stress response, when someone is really stressed or when they're really anxious, um, Again, it may make sense for them to have their sympathetic nervous system on in order to kind of help get them through that scenario. It can help us perform. Again, we don't want to demonize it. Yeah. The problem is, is in that modern day society, it's not like we turn on kind of, you know, the the sympathetic branch and then just directly turn it off. It's yeah. like we have all these compounding things that cause it to be on all the time. And then when we try to engage the parasympathetic break, it's just not listening. Like it's not very effective and a very efficient. So what HRV biofeedback is and we talked about this just a second ago but i want to kind of make the practical you know yeah. position for it 
It's all about teaching you better control of relinquishing the control that the gas pedal has, the sympathetic nervous system, and engaging the brake. And the way that we do that is through over time, we increase kind of your resiliency to stress predominantly through changing respiration, through changing breath work. And we utilize HRV as the objective measurement to see whether or not we have truly made physiological change. Because when someone's stressed and the gas pedal's down, HRV is going to be lower. And then when someone engages the brake and relinquishes control of the gas pedal, HRV is going to go up. That's just data. That's just information. What we want to see it coincide with is someone saying, I actually feel subjectively less stressed. I feel less anxious. It's because I tell people all the time, like I truly do not care. Like if you make all these significant changes in your HRV, it's great. Like from a physiological perspective, that's really good for the system. But if you're still feeling like really subjectively stressed, then there's some level of disconnect connect and there's a lot of room for growth there so i'm sorry uh jacko i've been talking way too long but i wanted to kind of clarify that side no 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 that's really 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 helpful um so in terms of um things that affect and we've already you've already touched on like a few things but if we're thinking about um people wanting to like we're on board and we're like okay i need to um i want to improve my heart rate variability it immediately makes me think of like two things it's like what are the things that are going to help improve it the most, but then equally, what are the things that are actually damaging to it? Like my diet maybe, or like what things can I make sure that I avoid doing and what things do I actually need to spend more time doing? What what are some of those things for people? Yeah. It's such a holistic question. And and, and because there are so many variables that are at play. Uh, One thing to clarify off the bat, because I I get this question so often is that, you know, people will see myself um, or others post like my, you know, readiness score, whatever my heart rate variability score, like on social media, and then they'll reach out and be like, what? Like, I see that your HRV is like, you know, a 140 or a 150. And I'm waking up at mine's at 20. Like, am I about to die? (laughs) And I always and I always have to clarify to them. I'm like, listen, listen, when it comes down to baseline HRV, as it stands right now, from a, a nervous system resiliency, stress resiliency, and human optimization and performance, there is no research right now that says we have any reason to provide a normative comparison, or in other words, okay. in non-scientific talk, that we have any reason to compare to others within our yeah. age, you know, same sex. Like we, we just don't have, there, there's no research out there yeah. for it. We are all about comparing to our baseline, up or down, significant changes in in either direction. That's really going to be the focus here. So when we start to examine how different factors or variables affect HRV, know that we're not trying to get everybody to a certain HRV of 100 or 120, whatever it may be. No, we're trying to increase your ability to modulate HRV or control the parasympathetic nervous system and sympathetic nervous system at will with volition. Like that's the key component here is not like trying to raise the score. It's trying to raise the score at will. But really, again, what are we talking about? We're talking about control of the nervous system. That's the key component. But back to your question, there's so many variables um, uh, that that we need to look out here for. So we have to remember, too, that if we're talking about heart rate variability being one of the key proxies for nervous system functioning, then anything that affects nervous system functioning for good or for bad is yeah. going to affect that metric of heart rate variability. So, you know, you mentioned one thing, one key component here, because I see this in, in different pillars, but yeah. one of the key pillars is, is nutrition. So what yeah. are we putting into our bodies? And one of the things that we know from literature is that highly inflammatory foods, especially if they're highly inflaming the nervous system, yeah. are going to significantly impact and impair heart rate variability. And again, more specifically, your ability to control your nervous system yeah. and hence your stress response. So what does that look like? That looks like highly processed foods that are really high and overly kind of confounded sugar, um, highly processed foods that are rich in like rancid vegetable oils and high linoleic acid. All of these things that we know can cause significant damage to the epithelial walls of cells, which would again, rancid oils, high, um, you know, inflammatory sugars, highly processed foods in general, um, yeah. just overeating also in general, all of these things can significantly 
influence and impact HRV. And we've seen people that have made all the changes in the world to their overall ability to engage in breath work, to engage in meditation, all of these kind of more stress resiliency practices. They're including exercise, which I'll get to in a second. They're doing all these great things, but they don't really make a lot of changes in their nutrition. They make that change and that variable is kind of the key component to where we start to see kind of that ability to control the nervous system go up. Because one of the things that you have to remember is that if we're receiving a highly inflammatory signal by what we're putting in our body through yeah. food, then our nervous system is going to respond accordingly. This is a foreign invader. Mm-hmm. This is something that is not supposed to be here. And so therefore, like turn on the stress response. The body's getting damaged. Like it's getting yeah. roughed up. So your stress response is needed in order to activate the immune system so that then therefore it can repair. So I, I am always kind of like keen on like uh, making sure that people are engaging in at least a more or less like I don't you know everybody responds differently to food so you know I don't care if it's you know ketogenic you know carnivore low carb you know vegan high carb you know vegetarian whatever your body responds to like yeah. that's that's what I'm a proponent of but more or less I'm a proponent of whole foods diets yeah. and reducing kind of like highly refined sugars and then also to like you know I think that the literature is pretty like it, it, I won't say it's clear clear but I would say that you know I could argue that you know a reduced um, uh, or at least compared to a standard American diet from which over here in America we I mean it, it is standard <laughs> is a really highly processed carb diet with just yeah. way too many carbohydrates hydrates and you know we see that with you know a lot of weight gain and you know metabolic yeah. conditions that that happen here it's worldwide but it's, you know yeah, specifically here in the in, yeah. in the US yeah. so exercise is is a big one the the other big one um, that I mentioned, uh, sorry, I said exercise. That's nutrition. what I was going to. Yeah, yeah. Food nutrition is a big one. Exercise is the next one, and yeah. I would say that um, other than breath work and meditation and biofeedback, um, that we probably see the most literature for changes in the nervous system uh, and overall health and well being with exercise. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of people ask me, so what does that mean? Should I should I engage in you know high intensity interval training, you know zone two training, you know r- weight resistance training? And I would say like probably all of them and mix them up and then assess kind of again how they affect you you know one thing to remember from a sports performance perspective is that the intent of, of exercise is to increase stress. It's to, it's to utilize yeah. exercise as a means of hormesis or hormetic stress. It's stress that helps to build better resiliency. Yeah. So it is all, you, you should expect that if you're engaging in hardcore workouts, that initially and maybe even 24 to 48 hours after a hardcore workout, you may see heart rate variability drop. Yeah. It's not yeah. a bad thing. Yeah. It's just, again, a warning sign to say the body has taken a beating, but when it builds back and it builds resiliency, then we again we see these numbers start to strengthen especially when we are engaging in you know really just high quality workouts and not doing a lot of overreaching and overtraining and i know that's that can be really hard for some like high performance athletes who are doing like long endurance type training you know they're running ultras they're running you know frequent marathons is that it's taxing on the body it is just really taxing so you have to balance that you know with other things in life because some things got to give sometimes like some people like They're all about like endurance training and running ultras. And I'm cool with that. They just have to realize too, that it's really taxing on the body and it may equate to, um, a little bit less resilience in nervous system functioning. And the last two that I'll hit on real quickly would be, can I, can I just make a point? uh, uh, Just something on that. Um, that I, I think that that's for a lot of people, whether they're, um, like I used to play uh, professional rugby, whether you are like a professional athlete or whether you were amateur, but if we're just like really engaged in our training and really um, mm. passionate about it, really enjoy it, one of the biggest challenges, not for everyone, but for a lot of people can be that they, we, we, we just keep that the, the gas pedal on too much. Yeah. And oh, yeah. having a marker like, hey, this is where I would see for someone like myself, heart rate variability being very useful to be able to go like actually jacko your system whether you like it or not whether you want to train today or not your system this marker is telling us that you are already like at a susceptibility to to stress do do we really want to then do a really hard training session and add more stress on top of that or actually can we use this to go no today is going to be a bit more of a recovery day we're going to do we're going to do some lower level exercise or whatever right. this that the other so that then you can do then better trading like the next day or whenever those whenever those things have changed. Because um, I found very interestingly on my, um, I'm trying to show uh, whether you can see, those are watching on YouTube, uh-huh. but the actual, yeah, um, yeah. 
the, the the Garmin I've got is like not an expensive one or anything, but there's a there's a body battery, <laughs> which is out of a hundred, mm-hmm. and uh-huh. like every I don't always wear it. I I don't wear the 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 stuff um, a lot. I just use it for really when I was running. Um, sure. But when I did my when I did my marathon, like we're in, we turn our Wi-Fi off at night. We're that type of uh, family in yeah. the, the Jackson. Me too. But, um, yep. So rather than having tech on whilst I'm trying to sleep, I'd, I'd take it off. But the um, interesting, whenever I'm like on holiday or a weekend where I'm not thinking about work or anything like that at all, the stress number is zero. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it's, it's yeah, fairly it's good incredible. at that. But yeah. the body battery um, would always seem to be a hundred at the start of the day. And I was like, well, what even is that? Is it really, it's, it's a bit right. of a crap marker. And uh, the eve, I did my marathon a couple of weeks ago on the, that was on the Saturday. Uh, Saturday night, I felt absolutely dead. Sunday morning, I was like feeling pretty bad. Sunday night, <laughs> Sunday night I was starting to feel good, and Monday morning I was like, I feel like I'm back. I feel pretty much back to normal. That's how my body, that's yeah. in, how I felt. I was yeah. like, oh, I just wonder what the watch would say. Like I always wake right. up with a, a hundred on my body battery. The body back, it was at it was at forty five. Like uh-huh. so, uh, yeah. clearly there was you still some recovery going on, but I yes. thought I felt okay. So yes. I would have potentially gone out and done a stupid run or something if I'd have not had <laughs> right. some of that. So um, I do think yeah. that's one of an out. Yeah, go on. Yeah. So, you you know, with exercise, what I tell people is it always comes down to um, kind of managing both uh, the objective kind of experience and subjective experience. Because one thing, too, that people could get wrapped up with, and I'm not I'm certainly not saying that you did this, is that um, the data that we're being provided by these wearables can sometimes, unfortunately, serve as like a self-fulfilling prophecy, because I've noticed that if I wake up and I feel like, oh, man, I feel rested, I feel really really good to go like let's do this and then you know an hour later i check my aura ring score and i'm like oh huh yeah i'm at a 60 or whatever it's yeah. not looking super good um then sometimes i'm like oh well yeah maybe it's right maybe aura is correct yeah. maybe i'm not you know ready for the day and i don't okay. feel super you know energetic and i feel taxed and and, and so i have to always watch out for that so yeah. for me i kind of have like you know a, a bit of parameters that i set you know yeah. I, i'm a i'm a scientist so i i have some objectives that I like to meet um, in order for me to kind of then kind of make, let's say, like informed consent as to what I'm going to do for the day. So for me, it comes down to when I look at my heart rate variability score from a for for a performance perspective and sports optimization perspective is I'll look to say, okay, from my baseline, I'll use a really simple, you know, numbers for everybody. Let's say my baseline is 100. I'm looking for two different parameters. Am I up or below within 20%? Or am I up or below within 40%? And what I say is if I wake up and let's say, again, my baseline is 100 and I wake up and mine is, you know, 80 or 78, 79 um, for heart rate variability. That's the RMS SD value, which is the best um, short-term measurement that's used in like Aura and Whoop and a lot of other devices. Uh, Then I'll say, okay, that's a signal for me to be like, okay. Like, let me check in uh, with the body. Uh, let me kind of see how I feel. Um, you know, not not a means like a red flag to say don't work out, but you know, it's saying like you know I might take it a little bit easier today. Maybe add some more breath work. Maybe more some more kind of just like slow movement throughout the day. Yeah. Uh, but then you know, if I feel good around the gym time, go hit it. Like I'm good to go. If I see it drop by like forty percent, then that's a pretty big red flag. That means yeah. the nervous system compared to normal, it's been pretty taxed. And so again, it doesn't necessarily say that oh i'm riding off working out but i check in normally if i've dropped 40 percent in my hrv i normally feel it like i wake up and i'm like oh man like i feel rough or the body's sore like i just don't feel like i have a ton of energy compared to normal and then that's where i'm kind of like okay maybe that's an off day or maybe at at a minimal like i'm going to get into like some light yoga moves like really focus on breath work like really focusing on activating the parasympathetic nervous system so you just have to watch out for it so always marry the subjective experience like how do you feel and then marry that with the objective data. Well, what does the objective data say? Because one thing that I got locked yeah. into, and again, because I'm, I, I'm just so scientifically focused, yeah. is that like initially, like I was all about like, whatever the data says goes like yeah. I trust the data and I do, I really do trust the data because yeah. the data doesn't lie. But again, because there are so many confounding and competing variables yeah. that can um, make up heart rate variability. Then one thing that I always mention is that you have to marry that objective data that you get with subjective data yeah. because you don't want every day to go about and you're just kind of living this self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. where, you know, you're just kind of like, well, I'm just going to base what I do on the aura score, but it can be a 
really good or or whoop. Um, you know, I'm I'm, I'm yeah, you know yeah, not yeah. Uh, I'm not ag- I'm agnostic when it comes to wearables on that end. Uh, but you know, I, I really think that you just have to trust your gut instinct at some times as well. Uh, but you know, some days like it's yeah. really going to be the telltale sign. Like, uh, uh-uh, pump yeah. the brakes. Like you are yeah. at high risk for injury, for overtaxation of the nervous system, for you know overtraining. Like you need to just chill. Like go do some yeah. yoga, go do some breath work. Yeah. Uh, which you know, again, even yoga sometimes can be a little bit more taxing than yeah. than you would want on those days. So you just got to be cautious and you got to know yeah. thyself. It's different for everybody i think it's but you make a really good point because otherwise we're potentially like not trusting ourselves Mm. and putting Mm -hmm. too much trust in technology and going well actually who what your body is that i would believe our body is like far greater than 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 anything else that man can try and actually make exactly and so Mm -hmm. not losing your trust in your own body and actually trying to engage more in um feeling your own body and and listening to what it's trying to say to you and use the hrv Mm -hmm. as a guide as part of that it's a a silly analogy it's making me think of and it obviously this won't um necessarily uh do it justice but i'm almost as you were describing thinking of um people following following a sat nav in your car and actually Mm -hmm. there's people have like driven into rivers and 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 things where it's like they just Mm -hmm. follow the sat nav no matter what and it's like but look out the window and if there's a river there like (laughs) don't drive into it you know it's like we gotta we can't just yeah don't just follow technology (laughs) blindly i think it's such a great analogy because it's true like the last thing we are already like i I say globally as a society we are pretty freaking mindless um, and it's bad. Like, and we trust too much in technology. It consumes too much of our life. I utilize it as a tool, as a means of proxy, as kind of information and data and data alone. The biggest thing that I tell people, especially if you're engaging, engaging in heart rate variability, yeah. biofeedback training, if you're measuring heart rate variability, the biggest point of concern, in my opinion, is that we are utilizing it to increase our enteroception, to increase yeah. our yeah, ability yeah. to detect changes in the body, subtle changes, because I don't want people to overly, overly rely on technology. And this is funny because like, I'm kind of like the fox guarding the hen house in some sense. I own a health technology company in the <laughs> biometric space. Like I should be like, no, go, objective data goes. Like you should be really only putting your full trust in technology. Like if I wanted to sell devices, I could do that. But I don't believe that. And we yeah. as a company at Hanu, we don't believe that. What we believe is that we can help people to become more aware of their bodies through technology technology but then if the technology is removed you're better at and yeah. you're more yeah, uh, able yeah. to sense direct changes increase that level of interoception like, that's what i want people yeah. to engage in not the other way around like yeah. if you use technology if you're really good at detecting change in your body and then you put on technology and you become less sensitive then i want you to like get rid of that technology yeah. like it's not helping you like the first line of defense for you should always be what you naturally innately have which is your body your ability to recognize change the problem, though, is, is Jacko, is that we disconnect from that so often because yeah. we're mindless in so other, so many other yeah. areas that sometimes we need a little bit of extra help yeah. and a little bit of kind of like a push to say, let's reconnect to the yeah, body. Yeah. Let's reconnect to your ability to detect change. And I think that technology can be a great avenue for that, but it should not be the thing that you say, oh, I'm going to rely on it from now yeah. on out, and then only that's going to be my means of, of determining where I'm at from a nervous system perspective from a stress or recovery perspective, like you're going to fail that way. Like it's not going to be good on the backside. Love your perspective on that. And, uh, and, and actually, and you know, I'm sure everyone listen, like appreciating your, your honesty about, about the, like it, despite it being, you know, something that you're, you're using and doing this, like going, well, actually, like I want you to be able to use it to be able to, to be able to understand yourself better and not become reliant mm-hmm. on this thing that yeah. I or someone else is going to sell to you. So let, let's finish mm-hmm. off then with to, a talk. You've yeah. mentioned about the, the tech side of things and we, we, need to, we need to cover that before we uh, to finish things off around. Um, you've mentioned Aura Rings. You mentioned uh, Whoop mm-hmm. Band. Um, I've done my wife um, where she works. Is, is, they've got heart math. Um, yeah. We've got all these yeah. different types of things. Some are a little bit more uh, accessible uh, and, and affordable than others um mm-hmm. what are some of the what are some of the differences or what are some of the pitfalls like i i always wonder where if my heart rate is a little bit dubious on my watch how is, on earth is it pretending it can detect the changes every millisecond mm-hmm. within it that yes. i question sort of that and so and then you know what have you what have you got in the pipeline for for Hannah health in terms of yeah, like what you bring into the space there 
Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. You know, we have seen such an evolution in uh, these wearable, <coughs> excuse me, these wearable te technologies' ability to detect heart rate and then also filter that data in order to calculate heart rate variability. So heart rate is relatively, even with movement, heart rate's pretty easy to capture. Like we've had that technology around forever. Heart rate variability is actually a lot more nuanced because mm -hmm. um, there are certain parts of the heart rate that we're detecting, and then the time difference between one part of the heart rate and the next part of the heart rate we have to get that pretty precise because again milliseconds off makes the world of difference i mean it's it's yeah. very very sensitive so what that means is is that a lot of technology out there right now that's detecting heart rate variability um is getting better at it um but really more so uh getting better at it when people are extremely still they add no other variables like they don't regulate their breathing like they just stay as calm as can be to remove artifact which is artificial data uh, from movement from light from electricity from all these other areas so you know i have trust and faith in pretty much every device that's out there right now and its ability to calculate at rest basic heart rate variability metrics and that's because heart rate variability metrics are actually based on algorithms that are open source that are the same exact thing so when you calculate let's say rmssd which is one of the main values that i utilize in heart rate variability it is calculated the exact same way on aura as it is with whoop now they may collect data a little bit differently but the right. calculation or algorithm has to be the same that yeah. is a known open algorithm now you know, again, I like all these devices. Um, you know, I think that one of the pit major pitfalls of some of these devices is they give you one singular data point. They give yeah. you RMSSD, and they don't give you, you know, frequency band data. They don't give you other time domain indices, frequency domain, or nonlinear indices. And all this is just scientific jargon for more data and more information. Yeah. But the more data and more information can actually paint the bigger picture and can paint the story. Um, I, I like getting into the nuances of things. And so what we're creating at, at Hanu Health is um, really an all inclusive closed loop system for training um, and so we are going to be obviously and I can't say a ton ton but I'll be yeah. a little bit cryptic about it mm -hmm. is that we are solving some of the problems that these wearables have on collecting heart rate variability data their ability to do it continuously and accurately but also provide appropriate training based on your individual biometrics right. and so we've put together a team of individuals um, who have been here for a long time doing this type of work and developing yeah. the most comprehensive scientific algorithms to accurately detect heart rate variability, but then also allow an engagement of training resiliency in the nervous system. So our product that we're developing is really intended for somebody who is either a biohacking health wellness optimization nerd who wants mm -hmm. to know anything and everything about their heart rate variability metrics at any given time. Yeah. And then also too, for the person who's just like, I am freaking stressed to the max and it yeah. is inhibiting sports performance and it's inhibiting relationships. Like it's inhibiting my decision making like work all of those things i just need help with something that can tell me you know when am i experiencing kind of like these significant changes and shifts yeah, in nervous yeah. system and stress and then like what do i do about it like yeah. how do i close the loop because what i tell people again is that these aura rings these whoops like these other wearables they're great devices for providing biometrics and providing data but data and information stops there yeah. um because it's just data yeah, it's just yeah. information it's useful in the sense that like it's it's informative but with without following up and doing something about it and engaging in behavior, kind of closing the loop, like what good is that data? It's yeah. not really, it's just information. Like yeah. you're, you're paying, you know, three, 400 bucks for a device just to tell you a little bit about your biometrics, yeah. you doing something with it that that's makes the, all yeah. the difference in the world. Yeah. And that's what Hanu is trying to solve in the, in the stress resiliency anxiety space. Yeah. Well, man, um, you know, I, and I'm sure thousands of people out there are very appreciative of all the work that, that you've done and you are continuing to do and, very excited about um, what Indeed, that thanks. tech is is going to be, and so uh, if like me, people are excited about what that's going to be, how can they how can they find more out about about you and uh, as well as Hanu Health and and, yeah. and potentially the tech when it comes out. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the biggest things um, is, is that those who are going to be privy um, to all the information soon, the soonest and have access and get a significant discount on our V one. 
um, uh, product yeah. is going to be those who are uh, who have gone on to our wait list, uh, which is growing immensely, and we're so excited and happy about it. So it's Hanu Health, and Hanu is Hawaiian for breath, and it's H A N U. That's H A N U. So HanuHealth.com slash waitlist, or you can just go straight to our website, yeah. HanuHealth.com. You can sign up, learn a little bit more about there. Yeah, it's going to look a little bit cryptic, but and it will be <laughs> cryptic for a little while longer um, until we are like, hey, we're dropping this thing, um, which, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be at some point next year. Uh, we don't know exactly when it's going to be, but sooner rather than later, obviously, yeah. it's any businesses, you yeah, know, hope. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and we'd love to make promises, but, you know, it's the health tech world. So, so sometime in, in 2022. Absolutely. You know, without a doubt. And what I will say is that again, like go on that list. We have our podcast, the Hanu health podcast, which we are yeah. obviously we featured you on. Yeah. Um, and it's really kind of, and, and our co-host there is Patrick McCune, you know, author of oxygen advantage. I'm sure most of your followers are going to know yeah. who Patrick is. Uh, he co all the co host all the Q and a episodes. And then we, you know, interview kind of more stress resiliency, breath work, you know, heart rate variability experts, people who are really in that space on the podcast. So, you know, you can you know follow us at Hanu health's website and on the podcast. Also, also follow us at Hanu Health on Instagram. I'm at Dr. J Wiles on Instagram, um, and hopefully, you know, you, if you go there, you'll you'll know, get a lot of great content and education in our field, all for free, obviously. Awesome. Uh, we'll make sure uh, in the show notes we'll put links into into the website, into uh, the podcast, and into your, both your social media. So um, we'll make sure Thanks, that people man. can, uh, if you're listening to this um, or watching on YouTube, then see the links in the show notes for for any of them. Um, so mm -hmm. other than that from uh, from me and all of the listeners um, Jay Massive thank you for coming uh, onto the podcast and uh, we look forward to, to well look forward to next year when uh, when the yeah, when yeah. the con mm -hmm. when the uh, when the product drops and uh, yeah excited to 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 see what we can do with it Absolutely. Thanks so much, man, for having me on again. Like I really just strongly encourage, maybe even challenge people to go sign up on the wait list, hanuhealth.com slash wait list. Like when, when you see what we're working on, I think you will, you will, you will be, it'll be well worth the five seconds it takes to sign up for the <laughs> yeah. wait list. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, man. Hey, thanks so much. I right, appreciate Jay. it. Thanks for joining. So there we have you. I hope you are far more, uh, uh, educated in understanding what the wearable tech that you may or may not have is uh is actually telling you about your body uh, and now uh, when we're talking about heart rate variability or hrv you actually know what it is and how it can be useful for you so a huge thank you to jay for being on the podcast and if uh, just to encourage you like i said at the end if you uh if you've got any questions for him or if you're interested a little bit more in about in heart rate variability and some uh wearable tech then do check out um hanu health uh, dot com for you better got links for the waiting list for his product that he's got and obviously uh, listening uh, to some of the amazing episodes that he's got on his podcast um and uh yeah if you haven't yet given us a review on itunes then please or iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast then uh, we'd really love you to uh, review the podcast uh, and uh, give us as many stars as you think it's appropriate if you thought today don't worry you know if you're a little bit like whoa hold on a minute timbo wasn't on this one don't worry he's back next week so you can give us if you if you were like oh that was only four stars because uh, or three stars because uh, Timber wasn't here then wait till next week next week's squad we've got an absolute crackerjack next week um, so uh, we'll be back to we'll be Timber will be back with us and uh, you can then give us the full five stars so up to you if you want to give us them five stars now head over or obviously you can wait but why wait just you know you know it's good if, unless this is of course this is the first time we listen to the podcast like well well, well Hold on a minute. What's going on? I thought it was... Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's it is the Tim and Jacker Show. We're back next week. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, or hearing... Oh, yeah, no, seeing you. If, you, uh, if you're into watching podcasts as well as listening, we are on YouTube as well. So check us out on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash School of Calisthenics. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, until next time, keep exploring your physical potential through movement, strength, and play.